had in this space and, uh, um, ever since we started doing this. So uh, uh, me, Brian, and Paul King here started Seattle Friends of Fission. So we, we wanted to, we as, I guess we'd say we're atomic humanists, something like that. We, <laughs> we believe nuclear power needs, uh, needs to be part of our energy mix so we can help solve climate change, help solve glo global poverty and stuff like that. But not a lot of people really know about it. So that's our job, trying to teach people about stuff that nuclear power um, that nuclear power is useful for. Um, try and you know bust some myths about it. Try and see what we can do to help uh, to help raise awareness about this great energy source. So this is one of those times that we're doing that. So our special guest here today uh, graduated with a PhD at Rensselaer Polytechnic in Institute. Mm -hmm. He interned over at Sandia National Labs, over with SpaceX, as well as with NASA. He currently works as a fission engineer over at a company called Ultra Safe Nuclear Corporation, which is a subsidiary? No, it's its own uh, small startup. Oh, it's its own small startup now? Yeah. Nice. Uh, but um, you used to be a NASA project that became a startup, right? I think it was actually the other way around. It was oh. a startup who pulled in NASA money. Wow. <laughs> so. Great. Even better. <laughs> And he's here to talk to you about nuclear space power applications. Give him a hand, guys. So my background is aerospace engineering, and I'm actually an aerospace engineer who became a nuclear engineer because I saw how important it was for the future. And as someone wanting to make a difference in the world, when I first started out, I said, oh, I'll go work for SpaceX and I'll do rocket, reusable rockets. They've kind of got that figured out pretty well now. What's the next step? And um, I think one of the areas where not very many people are working, where there needs to be a lot of focus, is actually nuclear for space applications. And this whole presentation is a very introductory thing into all the applications for nuclear power in space, where would you, you would use it, why would you use it, and how much the, the incredible amount of power that you need in space as well. So I'm going to start in uh, 1961. So this was the beginning of the space race, and the uh, NASA administrator, Ernest Stuhlinger, was in the middle of making the Saturn V rocket, along with Werner von Braun, and he got a letter from Africa. And this letter was from a, a very nice nun. And the nun wrote him and said, how can you justify spending so much money, so much incredible money on this space project? And she included pictures from her her charity works and orphanages that she attended where she was. And um, Ernest Stuhlinger came up with an amazing story that I'd like to put forth, um, the same story. And it goes like this, that imagine you're in 15th century Europe, and there's a count there who is privy to a, to a town in the area, and the count is very benign, he's very charitable, he wants to help people. So every year, all of the extra income he has from the grain and, and different projects that he has, he gives it back to the poor. And him and his wife were very devout. And one time, he was walking down the street and he saw this guy on the, on the side and he was polishing turtle shells. And when you polish turtle shells, they kind of become translucent. And they would bend light in the most interesting of ways. And he said, Wow, this is really cool. Come, come to my castle, live in my castle, and I'll, I'll fund you, and I want you to do this full time. And a little bit later, some of the townspeople were like, well, why are you spending so much money to finance this guy's projects? You could be feeding so many more people if you were using that money just to feed people. And as the story goes, because of his work, the uh, people after him eventually invented the microscope, which I think is undoubtedly the single-handed savior of modern health. More people have lived because of this invention than perhaps any other invention that has ever existed. So why should we look to space, or turn that question, why should we look to nuclear energy as a whole for answers when we have so many other problems on Earth? And, you know, there's, there's a lot of answers to this. And my favorite, what got me, is inspiration. Uh, the, the Apollo mission got so many people excited about space that it caused a boom in science and engineering. And throughout the 70s, 80s, 90s, all of these engineers, they brought about the semiconductors. They brought about 
the physics, the particle accelerators, all these great inventions, and it really was because you had something to dream about. And I hope that in this presentation that you'll be dreaming about nuclear in space. There's, uh, of course, catastrophes. This is the, the famous one. Um, Elon Musk and others generally talk about this. There's the asteroid, the um, zombie apocalypse, and, of course, the robot apocalypse. And um, all these things weigh on our minds, and we debate about it. So we can look to space, maybe not necessarily as the only answer to this, but it's one way to say, hey, we don't want to put all our eggs in one basket. Let's move out. Let's go into the solar system and spread our ideas. and and humanity out there. And of course, one of the biggest ones that actually is there is the threat of war, especially uh, nuclear war, and we have to always be on guard against that. So another one is, is just, uh, this is from XKCD, I love this. The universe is probably littered with one planet graves of the cultures which made the sensible economic decision that there's no good reason to go to space. Each discovered, studied, and remembered by those who made that decision. So if you know any politicians, you can uh, send them nuts. So this is one of the big ones I see. On, on Earth, we talk about Earth. Earth is finite. Earth is only so big. There's only so many resources on this planet. And we're kind of straining them. We're at a point where, yes, we, we can grow some more. Civilization is thriving. But we're, we're starting to wonder, you know, uh, climate change. We're starting to wonder about resources. And what the truth is, is out there just in the solar system, there's basically an infinite amount of resources. It's not a scarcity problem. It's more of a mindset saying, you know, one of the ways that we can help solve problems on Earth is by looking out there for other resources, for other ideas. So with that, I'm going to kind of begin into, into um, space. So I just, I just tried to make the case for space. And now I'm going to talk a little about why you need so much power in space. What is nuclear's role in space? Can't you do it with solar or, or something else? Um, so propulsion in space is one of the biggest requirements for energy. And all that really is is getting from point A to point B. You want to go from Earth to Mars? Okay. Now, you can think of it like a car. In first gear, you need high thrust to weight. You need a, a, basically a big chemical rocket that will get you from the ground into space. But that same chemical rocket isn't necessarily the same vehicle that you want to use once you're in space. Once you're orbiting the Earth, you have a lot of different options for traveling around the solar system. And then finally, third gear is interstellar. So whatever you travel around the solar system with probably won't be the same thing that you travel to another star with. And third gear, I'm not going to talk very much about. But um, if anybody has any crazy physics discussions they want to have afterwards, I can, can uh, cater to that a little bit. So the gear is in a little more detail. This is a log scale, Sun, Earth, um, Saturn, um, way over here to the nearest star. And um, first gear, it's kind of small, you can barely see it, but that's around Earth. That's getting into orbit. Second gear is anywhere in the solar system. And again, third gear is kind of, you're talking about going to other stars. So for the longest time, um, space has been expensive. So, Imagine a gold nugget floating in space. Well, was it worth your money to fly up to space and grab that gold nugget? Probably not, because for the last, um, about 20 years ago, the cost to go to space was much greater than the price of gold for the same thing you were sending to space. 14 karat gold, $24,000 per kilogram. You talk about the shuttle, $19,000 per kilogram. This is just, you know, it doesn't matter how awesome space is, how nice it is, it was just too darn expensive to be able to do anything in space. But there's some really cool things happening, and those things are happening right now. Um, you'll see the prices are kind of dropping, and, and there's one at this very end that's very important, and this is the Falcon 9 reusable Block 5. This thing is driving the cost of space flight down by about a factor of 10. And um, Elon Musk announced his even bigger rocket. This is the rocket that's currently flying. But there's one he's talking about launching and even going to Mars in 2024. It's, he's trying to drive the price of going to space to about $500 a kilogram. 
And while that's still very expensive, it actually makes you start to think, well, what does that equate to? And um, this basically equates to him, his goal is $500,000 per person to Mars. That's not cheap, not everyone will be able to do it, but that was his stated goal. He wants to drive the cost of spaceflight to where people can afford it. Now one of the other boons of this is nuclear power. Um, is traditionally, it, you have to have what's called critical mass. So critical mass means you need a certain size for a reactor to be able to be turned on. So if you're going to send a very low power, very small thing into space, unfortunately you need to send this big, bigger reactor into space because you need that critical mass. Well, now that we're talking about being able to put larger things in orbit, uh, we can start to talk about, well, what about putting that, that uh, a nuclear power source in space? And that's really the big development that's kind of opening the door for companies like mine to talk about nuclear power in space. So again, I was talking about this a little bit. You know, this is the Falcon Heavy, which is supposed to launch <coughs> later this month. It should be pretty cool. Um, this is really the key thing in here is um, when you launch a rocket, most of the cost in the past has been manufacturing and label, a labor. And um, then you have a fair bit of raw materials, and then you have about 1% or less as fuel costs. And um, basically what SpaceX and others are doing is taking these, these large pieces of the pie and eliminating them. So now, now that I, I've tried to make the case, you know, low Earth orbit is opening up. You can put things in space. Well, now what? And that really comes down to your vision, because some people don't necessarily see us traveling around the solar system or colonizing other planets. Some people do. And I'm in the latter category, and I hope to see within my lifetime a million people living and working in space, just like uh, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk have both publicly stated that as well. So there's actually some very good uh, movement on that front. This is something that came out of Bank of America and Merrill Lynch, two big investors, and um, a few things. Right now, the U.S. space market in 2016 is 339 billion. To give you some prospect, the entire power market in the United States, let's say all of the solar, all of the nuclear, all of the coal, everything, in terms of how much money is in that market, it's less than half of this number. So the space market, in terms of money, is already over half of what the market for all power is. And that's mostly from if you buy you know, satellite TV or satellite radio or this or that or the other. And we're only on the cusp of that, of that trend. Um, in terms of, of Bank of America, they're saying um, $2.7 trillion a year by 2045. And I think I'm going to be a little bit more bullish because all they're really taking into account is satellites. And they're, 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 they're not saying there's going to be people traveling to Mars or the moon. They're mostly talking about the uh, telecommunications market in space. So there's an incredible amount of momentum going in, in the space category. And I know another one, $16 billion in, invested in, in space startups. Um, really good stuff to get onto. And um, so I, I, I talked about first gear, right? So first gear is solved, right? I, I think it's about to be solved. We have SpaceX, we have Blue Origin, we have other companies that are all tackling getting to orbit. The next one, is of course this one, second gear. How do you travel in the solar system? So there is something called the rocket equation. So if you walk away from this, this not knowing anything else, you'll at least know a little bit about what's called the rocket equation. And this is, this is the fundamental thing. So in a car, you worry about miles per gallon, right? That's like usually the fundamental metric, or you might worry about top speed, or something else that you're really concerned about. But there's only and in terms of space propulsion, there's only one thing that matters, and that's what we call delta V. Does anyone play Kerbals here, Kerbal Space Program? <laughs> okay, okay, so we have a fair number of people who understand delta V very well. Um, and all delta V is if, if, is if you have a, a rocket and, and you're trying to get from point A to point B, it's the speed at which you're traveling after you've used up all of your propellant and there's gravitational wells and a few other things that make it more complicated, but it's really two pieces of equation. There's, there's one of how much propellant to payload that you have. So the more propellant to payload you have, the more delta V you can have. And the other one 
is how fast you're throwing things out behind you. So the faster you throw something out behind you, the more efficient you are with your propellant. So um, in terms of rockets, if you, if you use solid rockets, like the solid rocket boosters or even Estes rockets that you launch in your backyard or, or somewhere else, um, these have a certain velocity that, that the propellant leaves at, and that's about two to three kilometers per second. If we jump up to uh, liquid rockets, which are you know kerosene or liquid hydrogen or methane, you can get kind of a, a slightly a, a bigger boost. And the nuclear thermal, this one I'll explain a little bit more in a bit, but that's basically using a nuclear reactor instead of combustion to heat up particles and shoot them out the back of, of your rocket. And then you have um, just electric propulsion, and in that one you ionize your your propellant, so you take an electron off and now it's charged, and once it's charged you can trap it in a magnetic field and accelerate it to <coughs> literally millions or even billions of degrees if you want. Um, so what you want is a rocket that probably looks more like this than like this, because the more things you can carry the better it is. And some of the things that do a lot better than, at that are the type of, you know, the nuclear type propulsion thing. Um, I was talking about delta V. These, this is a little bit technical, but the idea is anywhere you want to travel. Let's say you want to travel from Earth to low Earth orbit. That's about 9.3 to 10 kilometers per second. If I want to go from low Earth orbit to, say, Mars, then I add up every single one of these in a row, and that tells me how much delta V it takes to go to Mars. And um, what I call it is it's a diminishing propellant fraction, and, and particularly in chemical rockets, say the shuttle, when the shuttle went into space, it carried less than 5% of, of, its, of its initial mass on the ground as payload to orbit. Well, now let's say you're in orbit and you want to go to Mars. Well, okay, now you're basically dividing by 10 again because Mars is about the same amount of delta V to get to. So you get to Mars and you're 1%. You come back from Mars, you're 0.1%. You can see how the Apollo missions, which were very much in the style, the Apollo missions, giant Saturn V, you come back with a little capsule. Those aren't really sustainable. We can't, we can't just throw away rockets like that. So what some people see the future as, there's different versions of the future, but one of them is uh, gas stations everywhere in the solar system. So you fly to one place, you have an empty tank, you fill it up. You fly to another place, you have an empty tank, you fill it up. And um, you might ask, well, where do I get this propellant from? And the answer is, well, you mine it. You know, if you're on the moon or you're on an asteroid or you're on Mars, there's different places, and typically what you want to mine is water. Because so water is combustion. When you burn something, it turns into water and carbon dioxide. So if you go the other way, you, if you take the, the water and carbon dioxide, you can use electricity to turn it back into fuel. Um, we don't do this very much on Earth because we have fossil fuels and other things like that, but when you're in a solar system, that's one way to travel around. Another one is actually, this is very good, solar can do an extremely good job at traveling through the solar system as long as you're within range of the sun. Uh, the sun's your limiting factor, and this, this graph here, let's say here's the Earth, um, the, the amount of power that you get per meter squared drops off very rapidly, and by the time you get to about Jupiter, it becomes really unsustainable, especially sat like um, all of these outer planets are very much nuclear bound, uh, nuclear type technologies. Um, there have been solar things that have gone to Jupiter, so it's possible, but if you ever want to send a person or something with a large power requirement, very difficult. Now Mars, Mars is on the cusp. Mars is a place where you could think about using solar, and it's not necessarily a bad idea. Um, but a lot of times you use it for propulsion, especially because when you're propelling yourself in space, you have a good view of the sun. You know, you're not on a planet where it's day and night. You have a really good view of the sun. So um, if you're ever traveling between, let's say, inside the asteroid belt, that's a pretty good place to use it. And um, then there's another one. And this, this one is interesting because back in the 1960s, put yourself back in the days of the early space race. Chemical rockets were actually not a very proven technology. Goddard had kind of messed with them. Other people had messed with them. But they actually, in the, in the early 1960s, the nuclear thermal rocket was being built, and an incredible amount of progress had been made on it. They had built nuclear rocket prototypes, sub, um, I think more than 10 of them, 
and it tested them many, many times, many, many cycles, and they said, this stuff is, is about ready, but when we go to the moon, we're just going to use chemical because it's ready now, but when we go to Mars, we're going to use the top stage as a nuclear thermal rocket. That's what Von Braun wanted to do. Well, turned out Nixon canceled everything, and um, they decided to shelve this project. So the nuclear thermal rocket, despite having prototypes and everything, got shelled, and they said, okay, well, we'll just bring it back when we're ready. Fast forward to now, you know, and uh, NASA's like, how does, uh, you know, we, we need to get everyone back together and try to figure this out again. And, and some of the, um, over the last about five or six years, there's actually been a few $10 million in the budget from NASA to study nuclear thermal rockets again and try to pull these out because the idea is really easy to develop because we've already basically looked at them in a lot of detail. So what these are is your propellant, and that propellant um, is a big tank of generally hydrogen. Um, you compress the hydrogen, and then you flow it over a reactor. And the reactor heats up the hydrogen, and when you expand the hydrogen through a nozzle, when it's in the center of here, it's extremely hot, about 3,000 degrees Kelvin, which is about as hot as you can get without melting something like tungsten or graphite. Um, and then when it comes out of here, uh, out of the nozzle, it uses, it turns pressure and temperature into velocity and it comes out the nozzle and especially because it's hydrogen. Hydrogen is a very small molecule which moves much faster than other molecules. It gives this a big boost over um, the other technologies. Here's some of the ones that they had tested in, in reference to a person. So you can see each reactor there and each of those reactors is on the order of um, like five tons or four tons, something like that. They're fairly somewhat light. Um, but uh, this was what I was talking about. In the last one, it was 10%. So if you go anywhere with a chemical rocket, you, you basically use up 90% of your rocket as propellant. But with this type of thing, it's more like 50% in time you go. So if you go, if you go to one location, it's a similar amount of delta V as the chemical one, you'll have 50% and then maybe 25 and 12.5. And that, that definitely seems more reasonable. And especially if you can also make a little gas station somewhere where you, you, all you're really doing is you're grabbing more hydrogen that you're flowing over the reactor. The reactor is reusable and the hydrogen is used up. So you just need to find a new source of hydrogen. And then here's a third type. Of, of propulsion that might be. Um, so we talked about uh, nuclear electric propulsion and I was, I was telling you there's materials limits in that NTR you can't get too hot or you melt your rocket but in this case they solve that problem by ionizing your propellant and when it's ionized you can trap it in a magnetic field and hit it with more energy and you can get it to the temperature of the center of the Sun if you want but it's a very energy intensive um, Device. So you need a lot of electricity, whereas the other one you just need nuclear heat. This one you need a lot of electricity to make work. Um, so this is the Jupiter Icy Moons Orbiter, which NASA actually did a lot of work on. They spent uh, $500 million and were going to build it, but then the shuttle crashed in 2004 and a new director took over and they ended up canceling that program. But it was aptly named Prometheus because Prometheus brought fire um, it's gotten a little skewed now that the movie Prometheus is out, and everybody thinks of that, but this was the Prometheus project, bringing fire to, to the, the solar system, more or less. Then here's another one, this is Ad Astra. Um, they are a company that has an excellent engine that can, it has the most um, potential for high thrust applications in the solar system, and high thrust generally means faster travel, so they can go to higher power, higher thrust, they're still, like for electric engines, for very, they, they have, they can handle a lot of power, but the problem is, is that they're like, imagine you have a 747 with these great engines and great wings, but no jet fuel, right? If you have no jet fuel, you can't go anywhere. So what, what these concepts really need for electric propulsion is um, generally a nuclear reactor, or if you're close to the sun, you can use solar as well. Solar is very viable. Um, and we have analogs to this. This is the Seawolf. The Seawolf was an amazing project. Over the course of five years, Admiral Rickover went from nothing to building the first nuclear submarine. And um, the nuclear submarine power level is actually very similar to the power level that you would see in these guys. 
The only difference is, is this was designed to operate in the ocean at low temperatures, and this needs to be designed to operate at very high temperatures in space. So there's a difference, but in terms of size and architecture, and in terms of lifetime, uh, new nuclear subs are meant to run for 30 years straight with no refueling. Um, I think their capacity factor is not 100%, but they can la they're basically an infinite amount of power, uh, more, or infinite amount of energy. In, in a nuclear reactor. And what you want to do is you want to be able to extract that energy in the form of power. So um, we kind of have analogs for that. And, and this is kind of more of, of what electric propulsion can do. You can have something more like 75% propellant. So whenever you travel somewhere, maybe you're, you have, it's more like a car. I call it the true you know, car spaceship because you, you fill it up and you go somewhere. And then halfway there, you can say, oh, I've decided I changed my mind. I actually want to go here, and um, stuff like this affords you that capability when you have um, these incredible efficiencies. So, I've talked a little bit about propulsion. So, propulsion, nuclear. There's different options. I don't know which way it'll go. It could go any of these ways. You might end up in a hundred years with a fleet of chemical rockets, with a fleet of nuclear thermal, with a fleet of nuclear electric. But regardless of propulsion method, I'm pretty sure nuclear will be needed because even if you go with the chemical route, you need something to mine your propellant. And electrolysis is, is generally the way you split water to create hydrogen and oxygen for your fuel. That requires an astounding amount of energy that you, it, it makes a lot of sense to use nuclear power for those types of processes. And if you want a gas station further in the solar system, there's, almost, there's basically no other option and to use that. And um, I'm going to get a little bit into planetary surface power. So this is actually one of the most important slides of the day. This, this may not look very important right now, but you can see food um, in this picture. This guy's growing grain, and he has these uh, special lights for growing grain in a greenhouse, just like if you're on Mars or if you're in space. Um, even though there's sunlight hitting your spaceship, you need a building <coughs> to contain the air pressure so you can grow plants, because plants can't grow in a vacuum. Um, so you need to build an enclosure, you need to put a lot of lights in there. And if you're on, on another planet, let's say Mars, you really want your own supply of food. You don't really want to rely on Earth. Earth gets angry at you, something like that. It could be a big problem. So this, you know, humans, what, what's 2,000 kilocalories a day? That's how many calories I tend, I tend to eat a little bit more than that, but we're all about 100 watts. That doesn't sound like a lot. That's about, amount, about as much power as you need for a laptop, right? Ah, that's not so bad. But let's talk about digestion. When you eat food, the calories you get from that food are actually uh, nowhere near as many calories are in the food as a whole. So you're only about 20% or 20 efficient at turning food into calories. So we're talking 500 <coughs> watts. Now, here's, here's another spot. So when you have plants or animals, but generally plants, they don't put all of their energy into their food, right? They only put half or a third, or in a lot of cases for most of the um, things that we pay a lot, like cashews, if you looked at how much energy is put into a cashew versus how much energy the tree had, it would be an extremely low number. But this is typically for grain. So about 33% of the energy that the plant has is put into making hydrocarbon bonds that are edible. So now we're at 1,500 watts. Now the last one is photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is actually uh, not terribly efficient either. Um, for some plants, it's as low as less than a percent. For a lot of efficient type plants, you can get up to 8%. And then if you're really technical, you can use uh, special lights that are red and blue rather than green, because plants are green because they don't use the green light. They, they throw it back out. If you use that, you might be able to get to 15% efficiency on your, on your photosynthesis. Um, so at the end of the day, this is 1,500 watts, 15 kilowatts. Now, how much power, does anyone know how much power you use in the US as, as an average? Uh, each, each per capita in terms of power is about a kilowatt. So in the United States, we use about a kilowatt of electricity for each person. In space, just to grow food, nothing else, 
for talking at least 15 times this, and in reality, probably 50 because one, you're not going to eat grain all day, you need a balanced diet, and two, there's wastage, there's going to be losses. Actually, food loses its nutritional value the longer it's on the shelf as well, believe it or not, that's another fact. But at the end of the day, if we want a space our society and we want it to be independent of Earth, we want to grow food, just the food budget is 50 times more, which, you know, imagine having to have 50 times more power now for every person. This is, this is United States energy usage levels too, right? This isn't third world developing country usage levels. So if you want to develop a society, the energy problem for just food is very key. And um, ISRU is, is something that, that we throw around a lot in the aerospace communities, and that means in situ resource utilization. So what does that mean? <laughs> that means when you go somewhere, you can't bring everything with you. You want to use the resources off the land. So the first explorers to the, to the Arctic, they tried to bring a big ship with all their supplies, and they all failed. But the guys who decided that they would talk to the um, native groups that were there, they learned how to hunt things, um, walrus, live off the land, they succeeded. And no one in England believed that they would succeed, but they succeeded because they used resources that were local. So space, very key to do that. And one of the things that nuclear is great for, is great, is heat processing. So if you, if you need to create electricity, that's inefficient. You can only maybe put at maximum 50% efficiency, but probably more like 25% efficiency of your heat energy into electricity. But if you use, um, if you don't need electricity, you can use basically all of that thermal energy. So imagine um, you're on an asteroid and you want to do something, you know, we type, typically think of foundries. They probably wouldn't use a foundry process. They'd use something called a, a um, bond process, but all of these things require a lot of heat or a lot of pressure or a lot of temperature, and they're all industrial. On Earth, we take things for granted, right? Trees grow fruit, plants grow up. In space, all of these biological things that we take advantage of on Earth, we have to basically recreate ourselves. So it's all a big power situation. And this is a little bit technical, but nuclear, on the bottom here, this is how much power in watts electric that you have. Um, as you increase the power of your system, so you go, this is a kilowatt right here. Um, this is a megawatt over here. As you increase the amount of power that you need, there's this metric here called watts per kilogram. So when you're traveling in space, one of the biggest things is you don't want to be heavy. The heavier you are, the slower you go, the longer it takes, the more costly it is. So you want it to be light. And um, one of the great things is is that as nuclear increases in power, its power um, per unit mass gets lower. And that's, again, I mentioned critical mass before, that when you have a reactor, it needs to be a certain size. Once you get a critical mass, you don't usually need to make the reactor much bigger to go to higher powers until you hit other limits, which are probably more in the, the 10 uh, megawatt to even higher range. So nuclear power scales very well in there. Um, so, and then a few other things, little locations in, in the solar system. So you think the moon, the moon is within that, that solar range, but um, there's a difficulty in that the moon, you know, the, the, we talk about lunar cycles, right? 27 days of, of um, is how long it takes the moon to turn, right? So if you're on the surface of the moon, it takes you, a, it, there's about 14 days of darkness and then 14 days of light. So if you want to use solar, you probably want to go to the poles. Because at the poles, you get a consistent view of the sun all the time. But if you want to go to the equator, you want to go into a crater to do mining or something like that, nuclear makes a heck of a lot of sense. Um, another one is Mars, which Mars is kind of on that cusp of being, it, you could do a lot of solar on Mars. But there are a few things. Uh, these got cut off a little bit. but. Um, if anyone here knows about opacity, so let's say you have a cloud on Earth. A cloud floats over your solar panels. Your solar panels have um, scattered light, so they don't turn off, right? The solar panels are still producing energy, but that, that light is being scattered. It's called diffuse light. So the light hits the cloud, it bounces around in the cloud, and a certain amount of it makes it to your solar panel. So 
on Earth, when a cloud rolls over, um, that's about the equivalent of, um, it's a little bit hard to see here, got cut off, but this is the time of year on Mars in terms of Mars seasons, and this is what we call the optical depth. The larger this number is, the darker it is. And in terms of what a cloud is on Earth, a cloud is, is somewhere in the um, kind of like 1.5 to 2 opacity. It kind of depends on the cloud and a lot of other things. These are dust storms that happen. Um, Mars, from a lot of the year, for over half the year, it's perfectly clear, great days. But in the southern hemisphere summer, the atmosphere has been frozen. It, literally all the CO2 in the atmosphere on Mars, about a third of it freezes at the South Pole every single South Pole winter. And then when the summer comes in the South Pole, all of that gas, it, the CO2 melts and it creates these huge wind patterns and the whole place um, kind of goes up into a dust storm. And um, I guess this picture got cut off too, but this is the, the color of the sky on Mars um, at different spots. So. If, if you're on Mars, um, you just got to know, you know, there's dust storms and you got to figure out, well, you know, how do I avoid this? And, and NASA has spoken recently a lot about what's called kilopower, which is a, a reactor, one of the first reactors that they've designed this far along in many years. And they want to use it on some of the uh, Mars missions because it's, we think of reliability in terms of the, the, the seasonal dust storms. Um, so this is kind of a general trade space of, you know, when would you use solar, when would you use nuclear, and it's kind of changing. Solar is getting better, so this curve is marching forward, but if you want something that produces, um, say, a megawatt, you're probably very solidly in the fission category in terms of it being uh, better watts per kilogram, better efficient, you know, in terms of mass, how much mass you'd have to put up there. But if you're in, like, the... The kilowatt, if you're in the like tens of kilowatts, even hundreds of kilowatts, um, solar looks pretty good. And that's again because of the critical mass. Your reactor needs to be a certain size, and once it reaches that size, it really doesn't have to have to increase in mass. Whereas if you want twice as many, as much power in solar panels, you have to have twice as many solar panels, or at least twice as much area in solar panels. Um, there's a bit more complication to that, but that's the gist. So yeah, pros and cons. There's a lot of pros and cons to both, but at the end of the day, they're very complementary, and you want both. You don't want to develop one in absence of the other or be completely reliant on one. Because as we said, a good mix of energy, just like on Earth we talked about grid stability. Um, in space, I would call it maybe grid reliability. Um, that nuclear has one thing, it's one reactor. And if something happened where you had to turn off the reactor for maintenance or something like that, you want at least a low-level backup power supply, something like solar. Um, so, and then a lot of times your reactor, when you turn it on for the first time, you're going to need some power source. And you're probably going to have some solar panels on the side of your nuclear reactor to help start up your reactor because you need to power instrumentation and various other things. Um, other locations. So... Radiation environment of Jupiter. I don't know if anyone had seen this picture. This is a really cool recent picture from the Juno probe, which is actually the solar-powered probe. Um, this is the pole of Jupiter. Um, so let's say you go to Europa. There's a lot of interest in Europa because it might harbor life in the ocean. On the surface of Europa, you have 5.4 sieverts per day, which Sounds weird, but that basically would say about one day would give you your, what we call the LD50, which means you would probably die um, if you were on the surface for a day. Um, so, uh, we talk about um, Europa, we're still really interested in it. So, there's a guy, there's, um, I forgot his name, but he's the chair of the House Science Committee. And he is obsessed with Europa. He keeps putting money into NASA's budget to do Europa. And um, they really want to do a melt probe. Because what they want to do is put something uh, nuclear powered, of course, on the surface. And they want to heat up the ice and kind of melt through it and go into these zones which are kind of close to light. And see if, once you get far enough in, there's no radiation because the water will block it. So once you get within that zone, is there any life that's creating, you know, is there anything there, right? And um, there's active uh, work being done in that area. NASA really wants to do that mission. So 
this is something that that nuclear could do really well um, melt probes um, another thing about the environment is solar flares so uh, in 18 I want to say 80 somewhere around that range there was a big solar flare that took out the telegraph lines back in the day um, we haven't had another one that big for a very long time, but they happened. There was, just a few years ago, there was what we call a Carrington-level solar flare, but it went the opposite way. Um, these things tend to really mess up solar panels. Um, so there was this Hayabusa mission put out by the Japanese Space Agency, and it was to go to a comet and grab some samples from the comet. And it got hit with a moderate, not a super uh, solar flare, but it was a reduction in power by about 50%. Um, if a nuclear reactor got hit uh, with that, basically nothing would happen. There's a person at, at um, she graduated from Michigan, and her thesis was basically a little bit on that, how does space radiation affect nuclear reactors. Now, your auxiliary systems, so your computers and everything, you still want to be shielded, but at the end of the day, your reactor is, is rad hard because it's basically, it, it's already in a very high radiation environment. Um, and of course, uh, you, might have, you might remember this, this picture of Pluto. Uh, this was a ye about a year and a half ago. The New Horizons probe flew by Pluto, and it was powered by something called an RTG, which that might be a little bit confusing because I talked about fission for the most part right now, but there's also what we call radioisotope thermal generators. There are different types of nuclear power. And um, in the US, we've done a lot with RTGs. Um, if you can believe it, this is the New Horizons probe. This is Curiosity. Voyager. Voyager is now, um, I believe, I believe it's about twice as far away as Pluto. I'm trying to remember a hundred and something astronomical units and Pluto is about 50. And uh, it's still <coughs> communicating with Earth, believe it or not. We're still getting data. In fact, they just fired up the thruster not very long ago to, to do a little bit of course correction to turn the antenna a little bit better towards Earth. And it worked. And uh, it's enabled by RTGs, uh, which I'll get into the physics a little bit. This is Cassini. It was the Saturn one that recently had its death throw. It's been orbiting Saturn for many years, and they decided it's about to uh, um, hit its end of life. They decided to crash it into Saturn, both as an experiment and um, as a way to not contaminate kind of the moons of, of Saturn. So Cassini brought back some wonderful pictures just this last year. And so these are all recent missions. Um, there's a whole lot more of them, about 33 more of them that, that have gone up in the past. Um, can't see all the tracks, but this is the Earth, and these are all the different missions that go different places. It's an infographic, and if you look at the ones that kind of go out here, basically all of them were empowered by, by RTGs, by some form of nuclear power. Um, so this is really critical for our uh, deep space um, program. Um, I'm going to touch just a tiny bit on uh, fission versus RTGs or decay. Um, so, and, and, and I'll start with decay. So, some people uh, would, would, would call something nuclear waste if it's emitting radiation. But in space, in many cases, we call it power source. There are certain isotopes. Um, specifically one called plutonium-238, which it's not a weapons isotope. That's one that during the weapons program, they're like, we don't like this 238 stuff. So they took it all out, and we had a whole backlog of it. And they said, well, what are we going to do with it? Well, it creates a lot of heat, so let's put it on a spacecraft. So the U.S. has launched 33 of these um, RTGs into space, and the Soviet Union and uh, launched quite a few of them as well. Um, so these are a little bit radioactive, so there's a large number of precautions that you have to take. You have to encase it in a special thing so that if it comes back to Earth, it doesn't spread out. Um, the one that they had on the Apollo 13 mission, uh, they did a course correction to last minute so that if it re-entered, it the whole thing would go into the Mariana Trench or deep into the Pacific Ocean rather than into um, perhaps some um, place that had people in it. Um, <coughs> 
Now this one, Fission, is more of the one that I'm talking about because um, RTGs um, or radioisotope thermal generators, they can't be controlled in their power level. They're kind of just creating a certain amount of heat. And they, if you want human scale power, I've been talking about these large power numbers, you really want fission because fission is what can be controllable and you can create more power, less power, as much power as you want. One of the great things about fission is it's controllable and we control it through neutrons. So a neutron, we, we have these devices that basically control how many neutrons get, how, what happens to neutrons in a nuclear reactor and we kind of mess with it to hit a neutron with, with a uranium atom, we split the atom and then in addition with splitting atoms, it creates more neutrons, and those more neutrons kind of creates a chain reaction. So in this way, by controlling the number of neutrons, we can go up to higher power to lower power. And generally what you want to do in a reactor is you want to go to a high enough power, but not so high that you can't remove heat. Because if you can't remove the heat, your heat builds up and your reactor gets too hot, and you don't want that. <laughs> um, so uh, this, these are the, the two things. And, just to get into a tiny bit more, some people might talk about fusion. And I, I will say only good things about fusion. There's a lot of people working on it here at UW. We have actually some of the premier plasma physics research. Um, and uh, that's there. But one of the benefits of, of fission is that it's pretty easy. All you do with fission is you put two blocks of uranium next to each other, more or less, and it creates heat. Whereas fusion, you have to recreate the conditions of the inside of the sun. So it's a bit harder, and we're still working on it. Um, so uh, yeah, again, fusion, putting things together into bigger atoms. Fission is breaking things apart. And funny enough, for medium-sized atoms, specifically iron, if you ever wonder why there's an iron core in the middle of the sun, I think in our sun there's not, but in larger, larger stars they build up an iron core, and the iron core builds up until eventually it gets so big that f fusion can't be supported anymore, then you have a supernova. That's what causes supernova. It's iron because iron doesn't produce energy when it, when it fuses. Um, so, um, you know, you, I, I want to talk a little bit about safety because there's so many misconceptions, mis but there's a lot of information, a lot of confusion about safety. and I. I first want to point out, this is uranium ore. If you live somewhere, uh, maybe Colorado, um, maybe Utah, you're, you're just going to find uranium ore sitting around. This isn't something that, that we refine. And even when you enrich uranium, the radioisotope of uranium-235 and 238, in terms of how radioactive they are, is very similar. So uranium by itself is not terribly radioactive, very mildly radioactive. Now, here's something that I love. Um, one of the guys from Los Alamos did this thing of, what would happen if on the launch pad, you went up to this uranium reactor and hugged it? How long would you have to hug it for to get uh, the same dose as someone hiking in Colorado? You'd have to hug it for a day to get a day's worth of Colorado radiation. And that's because, again, uranium itself is very benign. What isn't benign is when you start fissioning atoms. When you have this uranium atom and it fissions, these halves that are left over, that's the part that's typically the waste. You want to get rid of that. Um, so there's also actinides, but all of these things are built up when you turn the reactor on. So, um, I guess this is a good comic too in terms of uranium power density. Um, you know, this is why they created log scales. It just has an incredible <laughs> amount of energy inside of it. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, again, how, you know, fission is not very radioactive until it's turned on. So our goal when we're launching, if, if we're on a launch pad, what we do is we make sure it can't turn on accidentally in any way. Different ways you can do that. Uh, you can launch it in two parts. If it's in two parts, it'll never achieve a critical mass. You can put special um, types of materials inside of it that will not let it go off until someone actually goes in there and does something very special to take it all out. So there's a lot of methods. This is an engineering practice. So some people say, oh, if the nuclear rocket goes up and it explodes, or let's say not a nuclear rocket, but a chemical rocket has a nuclear reactor and it goes up and explodes, it'll, it'll cause some kind of mayhem. And the actual truth is, is that it's not going to cause much damage at all. What the real risk is, is all of the toxic type of 
rocket debris that's falling from the sky, and there better not be any boats underneath of it. Um, so, um, in terms of fission, there have been 34 reactors launched. One of them was a U.S. reactor, and 33 of them were Soviet reactors. Um, in terms of RTGs, there's been 44, and most of those were U.S. Um, so, this is a point that, that, that I want to make here, too, is that radioactivity. If something is radioactive for a billion years, it's really safe versus something that's radioactive for a day. Because that's a measurement of all, all radiation has what I would call a fingerprint. So if, if you look at everyone's hands, everyone has about the same size of fingers. Some people have bigger fingers, some people have smaller fingers. But all nuclear um, radiation is somewhere in the realm of, of tens of kilo electron volts to um, maybe a couple ten mega electron volts. There's nothing that's extremely more dangerous than the other in terms of energy. Um, there's a little bit more complexity to that, but the basic idea is if something has a really short half-life, that means that half of the atoms in there, after an atom emits its radiation, it usually goes into a stable state. So that means if I have something that has a half-life of a day, in one day every single one of those atoms will emit radiation, whereas if I have uranium, which is kind of the billion year type half-life, it takes a billion years for that same amount of radiation to be emitted. So the longer the half-life, generally the safer it is. The shorter the half-life, the more dangerous it is. So uh, uranium-238, 4.5 billion years. Uranium-235, 700 million years. The RTGs are quite a bit hotter, 87 years. So they're about 100 million times more activity in them um, than fission. Um, so again, I was kind of focusing a lot of this on, on uranium, and um, you probably remember James Conka uh, talking about uranium in seawater a while ago. Um, so the question is, is, okay, let's say there's a launch disaster, and the reactor somehow gets, gets blown into little pieces and spread out. Well, in every cubic kilometer of ocean, there's the same amount of uranium as what would be about a space reactor. And um, there's about 1.4 billion cubic kilometers in our ocean, so you'd have to have about 1.4 billion launch accidents to double the amount <laughs> of uranium. And that's kind of a little bit of a, of a simplification, but it's basically true that in terms of fission, the ultimate safety is you do not turn it on until it's in a far enough location. Some people can argue over what far away enough is, um, but certainly when you're on the moon, when you're on Mars, um, and if you're talking about radiation in space, that's a whole other talk, but the radiation environment in space is on the order of 100 times greater than that on Earth. And because of that, it's, it's already fairly radioactive in space. It's not like you're spewing this really clean environment with tons of radiation. No, space is basically, I was talking about Jupiter. Jupiter focuses the radiation in its belts because of its magnetic field. And, and things like that, that there is, you know, a pretty good safety case for fission reactors. There's not, if someone says, if it blows up, it's going to destroy the world, try to crack them, please, for me. Just, just, just do that. Um, so, I want to, so I want to talk a little bit about how this comes back <coughs> to the Earth technology, you know. So I talked about space, and I hope I've given you a lot of enthusiasm, inspiration, and that's really one of the key ways to, play, to pay it back, is uh, getting more people into math and science and things like that. That's a huge plus. Another one is the technology, and you might say, oh, what has NASA invented with the space race? And well, you can kind of see, well, satellites, weather, a lot of semiconductors, GPS, supersonic. It's not unique to space. Any type of research, nuclear research, gives us an incredible amount of knowledge. Think about medicine. The MRI machine used to be called the nuclear MRI machine. It was the NMRI, not the MRI. They decided to take nuclear off because it was bad publicity. And the truth is, is it uses nuclear physics. All nuclear means is it deals with the nucleus of an atom, right? Um, I do like to tell a story of um, about, a, let's say, 100 years ago when electricity was new. A new house was built with new electric lights. The next day, the house burned down. The city decided to outlaw electricity. 
Now, take that to the nuclear side, right? We've had some bad experiences. with this. You know, there's certain things that have happened that we wish had happened differently, but does that mean that we as a species can't handle it? You know, if that's the truth, it's my belief that we'll never spread into space. Uh, we'll never go further out. So, that right there is, is one of the key points here. So, nuclear technology is, is an incredible thing, and if you go to the national labs, you'll see just a little bit about how much they're figuring out there. Um, now, in space, one of the things that you can do is you can start to talk about innovation. You can talk about, what if we try this new thing, whereas on Earth, you're really bound by kind of economics, by what's been done before, by competitive markets. You've seen kind of Westinghouse's problems and all these reactors that are being built terrestrially, a lot of them have had a lot of financial trouble recently. And a lot of that's because all of the research done on them was done quite a long time ago, and they kind of need to innovate in some way. So we talk about different types of reactors and kinds of reactors, but they're very expensive R&D-wise. So space, in my opinion, is the perfect R&D development ground for that type of thing. And of course, global warming is also a very key thing. If, if you want to stop global warming and you're talking about looking at the projections that we see now, nuclear is still the only option for stopping it within the next few decades. Solar and wind, they will eventually reach their, their runaway points, but in terms of technology growth, technology path, it would take much longer. And unfortunately, we're kind of going that way with current trends, but nuclear would do the best job. We, we have a solution there. And places like China, so we talk about the US isn't doing so well, but China is putting a new reactor online every year. And um, they are doing extremely well. India is doing pretty well as well. Like, it, you know, just because in the US it's not working out, globally it's doing very well. So, um, I want to talk a little bit about um, my company, uh, and then I think that'll be about the end of the presentation, but they're developing, this is again kind of the space technology transfer, they're making a, a small gas-cooled reactor, terrestrial-based, and uh, low power operation for remote areas, they have very high temperature operation, and the people in the company know a lot about nuclear materials, they do very well at that. So. What I, what I liken it to is they have all these really cool Legos, right? So I like to play with Legos, but if I had to pour all of my own Lego blocks, it would be very much impossible for you to make any cool creations. But because um, they have that type of thing, um, I get to work on, I can't tell you too much about all the things that I do because um, a lot of these things are kind of within the company, but you know, I basically get to work on what I love. Um, this is a reactor core design, a lot of system design, um, space type things. And um, our company, again, it was a nuclear startup that um, pulled in some NASA money. So we have a self-funded R&D division uh, for a lot of space stuff. And one of the reasons I came to the company is because they have a very good fuel for space environments. Um, so yeah, let's, this is, you know, if, you, if you can't already tell, um, that's who I am. <laughs> and um, so with that, I think I've taken up about the hour. Guys, thank you so much for coming. So much people are here. It is amazing. I'm glad y'all are so interested in learning so much about what nuclear can do, at least when it comes to going to the stars. So thank you. Um, so for those who don't know, we are going to set this up on YouTube. Uh, it's going to be there. We're recording it. Thanks to our amazing Most video guy, uh, Carl Paul. The camera's not nuclear powered, so it kind of So, you know, if y'all want to get an update on when that um, video pops up, uh, feel free to sign up for their name and your email right here. And if you'd also like, we can notify you the, the next set of events, panels, or anything like that that we'll start hosting in the coming year. So again, thank you guys so much. We'll leave it for questions and we'll pass this around. All right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. There y'all get out. Yeah. yeah. So with that uh, core diagram you showed us, those curved things, were those reflectors? Uh, those are what we call control drums. Right. Um, there we go. 
So these, um, <coughs> typically these are absorbers. Oh. So as you turn them in, they shut the reactor down, and as you turn them out, they'll start the reactor up. Mm -hmm. And because space reactors are typically small, a lot of times you go with control drums, whereas terrestrial reactors are typically a bit bigger. So in order to get the control you want, you typically want something in the middle rather than on the edges, so they go with control rods. Okay. You mentioned about the nuclear thermal program. Uh, one of the big concerns about that was the hydrogen storage. It's uh, being the lightest material. Uh, the problem with the space mission is the size of a tank. Yeah. So how do you propose addressing that going into the future with nuclear thermal? Well, active cooling is a technology you can use with electricity. So if you have a reactor on board, we typically, there's a lot of designs to talk about bimodal, which means you're most of the time you're a nuclear thermal rocket, or that's what you're primarily designed for. But you have some small ability to generate maybe kilowatts of power. Mm -hmm. And with that, you power a cryo cooler to do it. It's still going to be very difficult, very complex. But um, that ISP boost in terms of, uh, or the exit velocity, when you talked about how fast you throw things out, when you use hydrogen, it's so amazing that, mm -hmm. that you, the nuclear thermal rocket really makes sense with that. Uh, UV Fit discussed about the uh, mining water from asteroids and uh, moon, etc. So, in order to convert uh, water to energy, we also need carbon dioxide, right? So, with hydrogen, um, H2 and O, you can just split it in electrolysis, but with, if you want to make methane or some other ones, you need carbon from somewhere. So, yeah, that's typically where the CO2 is. And is there enough carbon dioxide in space to convert water to fuel? On the moon, there's, there's not much. On Mars, there's plenty. On most things, um, you can actually tell a lot about companies by what fuel they pick. So <laughs> SpaceX chose methane with the carbon in it because they're thinking about Mars. The moon might have carbon somewhere, but there, it's not easily accessible. Um, if you look at other companies like the ULA or Aerojet Rocketdyne, a lot of those are the hydrogen, Hydrolox engines. So they're thinking about the moon or the asteroids and things like that. So, um, yeah, those carbons can be hard to get sometimes. Um, there's also carbonaceous chondrites, which typically if you find water on an asteroid, you also have carbon somewhere else, but it's not. On Mars, it's just so easy because Mars has a very thin atmosphere that's almost all carbon dioxide. It's gravity. Yeah. Yes. You know, of a lot of the proposed solutions for using nuclear to go from ground to LEO, do you think any of them hold any environmental feasibility at this point? Would it be nice just to, you know, eschew with chemicals altogether and just build a nuclear system that could do it? Yeah, I think it's a difficult thing because you know you're going to get a performance boost, but at the same time, you turn on your reactor while you're close to Earth. And um, how I kind of scoped my thing is I'm like, well, you just turn the reactor on when you're away from Earth. So that is a policy question. Um, and I think generally chemical rockets can do the heavy lifting um, because they'll, they'll go up and come back down. Um, back in the 1960s, that might not have been the case when they had the Orion program and a lot of things. But you have Elon Musk with his really big rocket. I, I think that's kind of the first gear. First gear, I would say, would probably be, be at least within Earth. You might have an argument, like if you're on Mars, well, you know, maybe you can have a, a nuclear takeoff from Mars um, and not be too bad. But that's kind of where I, I would suggest it. But it's an open question. Uh, sorry, me again. Uh, do you think um, something, you know, such as a NERVA or uh, nuclear propulsion would also benefit from, instead of using a, a, a skirt nozzle, uh, using an aerospike? Um, so those... Uh, I'm not, I know the rule of thumb is that the aerospike isn't pressure dependent, but I know that in space you want an infinitely large nozzle, and I think there's a mismatch there somewhere. I don't know if you, if you'd have, maybe you could ask the guy next to you, it seems yeah, like. Yeah, aerospike is for uh, ground up, you know, you need an atmosphere, you need that balance, pressure balance for it to have the air efficiencies. All right. But when you get to space, he's right, you need that infinite uh, nozzle. Gotcha. Yeah. But that's where uh, you get electric propulsion, right? I mean, you get the, the highest exit velocities for electric propulsion because of that. You can accelerate ions as fast as you can. Yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, so what are good near term and then maybe a little farther on long term solutions for cooling these nuclear reactors in space? So the one, the big one is you want high temperature capability. So on Earth, uh, most reactors are water reactors. And unfortunately, when the water boils away, it turns to steam, you have no way to remove heat. In space, um, you want them to be higher temperature. So, and you typically want a gas reactor, although there are many options for liquids. Gases are nice because you don't have to worry about them. Bubbles, like bubbles in space, you don't have to worry about um, freezing or, or evaporating, whereas a gas, as long as it's at a high enough pressure, um, you'll probably still need a pump, but you can easily do a pump-based system. Um, as you go to higher powers, like if you were to go to a gigawatt rather than a megawatt, <coughs> then you really need a liquid rather than a gas. But in the beginning, um, gases make a lot of sense. And I think that's, it, like kind of my, th this is kind of me interjecting my company here, but it's like, their small gas cooled reactors are my thought about the best thing. Some people really like sodium, some people have suggested molten salt, but I think gas is going to go. Could you use super fluid helium? Uh, so yeah, you would use, well, um, helium at, at a few megapascals or something like that. Because because these are so low power, in space um, we're talking about generally like one megawatt, maybe 10 megawatts. Um, generally the cooling requirements are very easy. Um, so you have a reactor, in terms of how big it is, it's the critical mass. And then it has so much surface area in the reactor that you can cool it really easily until you go to a high enough power that then you need to have either more compressed gas or more coolant poles or something like that. So there's, there's a design process, but for the first generation space kind of nuclear things, I don't think there'll be a ton of, of thermal base constraints for lower power stuff at least. Actually, this, this is a little silly, so you don't have to answer it. It's just something that I've been curious about. Why have people proposed plasma-based fission systems? You know, there's been plasma confinement ideas where you take uranium hexafluoride, ionize it, and then use the heavy ion in some sort of compact torus. Just like, what is the idea behind any of those systems if you looked into them at all? It just doesn't seem yeah. to make sense to me. Um, the benefit is, is when you have an atom that fissions, it splits in half, and those halves are traveling at incredible speeds. So in terms of that exit velocity, it's, it's, base, it's, it's on the order of like 50 mega electron volts per particle. Like it's, it's, it's a whole lot of energy. So you get really good efficiency. So that's the benefit is if you have like a, a dusty plasma is what they call it. If something fissions, it should be able to escape the dusty plasma without losing too much energy in the dusty plasma. You can use it for propulsion. But that's kind of a much more advanced type topic. How close to feasibility do you think uh, bi and trimodal uh, NTRs are? Trimodal, I'm not familiar with that one. Uh, that would be um, just bimodal plus uh, liquid oxygen injectors. Oh, OK, yeah. yeah. So that would be the so augmented years. blocks. Yeah. I think uh, you start small and then you build up. That's what I loved about the Apollo program. Is, well, generally you start with Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and you did all these steps. And I think they're all very feasible. Um, it's just you have to start, start easy and then move up. Like I might suggest the first system you might make might actually be um, some other fluid other than hydrogen as a kind of a test case. There's a lot of people who argue and, and go back and forth, but. Um, I would say go, because if you, instead of 3,000 Kelvin, if you're at 1,500 Kelvin, I think you still get like 700 seconds of IRP in that range. So it's still a big improvement over chemical, even if you use much lower temperature. So you start there, and then you turn up the knob a little bit. So in addition to space, do we see nuclear sources of energy powering our everyday devices on Earth, like maybe cell phones or watches? Uh, so... The, I talked about the RTGs, um, they used what some people would call nuclear waste. Um, but this same type of technology, there's, there's a group right now that wants to put it in a diamond. And in a diamond, if you have um, a certain type of, of radiation interaction with a diamond lattice, it creates electricity. And you can get like 30 years of really low voltage, low amperage electricity. And of course, 
in every home, we talk about like you know nuclear radiation and fallout and everything. But in every home, you have a smoke detector, right? And in every smoke detector, there's micrograms, so a millionth of a gram, of something called americium-241. And americium-241 is about four times less, so it's just about as radioactive as the plutonium-238, but it's in every house. And they used to put tritium in all the exit signs, too. Um, so we do see a lot of these technologies around. Um, I think you have to be careful about how you do it, but they, like some people even do, you know, cancer treatment is a big one. They take what's called cobalt-60, or, and that one's for a radiation of cancer, where they actually build reactors, um, and they, sometimes they harvest, or sometimes they build a reactor to specifically make certain isotopes. Um, so, some people call some of these nuclear waste, and other people call it power sources, and um, I think, it, it's a question of relative risk. Like, we need to have an honest, sit down, good conversation about real risk. Not some, like, oh, like, that, that quote that a thimble full of plutonium would kill everyone on the planet is blatantly wrong. Blatantly wrong, 100% wrong. Because if that was true, there's certainly more than thimblefuls of the americium 241, and it emits the same type of radiation. Um, we need to have an honest conversation, sit down, and, and talk about things like what is the real biological response of humans to radiation? If we increase background level by a certain percentage, is that detrimental? Some people even say that getting a dose of radiation every now and then stimulates your immune system, and it could be good for you. Um, but I think if we can have an honest sit down conversation, do real science, I think we'll find but a lot of these isotopes that we consider waste will find uses in phones and stuff. They won't be, I don't think they'll be power sources in the sense that if something is actually generating enough power to power a home, there's a fair bit of radiation there, so you probably don't want to hold it in your hand. But they will be for all kinds of really low power devices or for sensing or for medical procedures and things like that. So with how you're... Uh to kind of go off what you said of how, you know, some people saw, call it nuclear waste, some see it as an energy source. Um, and you said that in space, or sometimes with a reactor, you need to kind of kickstart it. Like, let's say if we were to use an LFTR in space, or a type of um, thorium reactor, you would need to have a starter for that, right? I uh, have a bit of a silly idea. We have tons of ICBMs loaded with plutonium. If you were to have a disarmed one, send it up and capture it, I mean and then disassemble it up there and then use that plutonium as the starter. <coughs> I just see it as a, as a way to lighten the load of the primary rocket. I guess a few things. Um, one is the plutonium they use in those can't be used in the oh, same 239. Way. They're different. Yep, my bad. Um, the 239, though, could be put in a, a, a reactor. You know, so it's something that would be good for some reactors. And there's, um, in a lot of circles, plutonium is a very dirty word. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we need to sit down and have a realistic conversation and actually talk about things like nuclear non-proliferation safeguards and get the big picture, not just, oh, it's plutonium, it must be terrible type of thing. So yeah. Actually, plutonium uh, raises a good point. Is there any sort of advantage to doing breeding in space, to using like a breeding fast reactor? Or can, for most things, can you take just most of your nuclear fuel with you? about lifetime. So if you want something that lasts decades, you probably want to think about some breeding. If, you, if you're thinking of something that lasts a few years, um, you probably don't need it so much. Ultimately, we're going to push the limit. So if we can get to Mars in a month, then we're going to want to get there in a week. And at some point, <laughs> we're going to reach our, 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 our limit, and then we're going to have to start talking about, you know, well, burn up is an issue. But in the beginning, for lower power things, Burnup's not as much of an issue. Yeah. I have three questions. Is that okay? <laughs> sure. So you said that you're running the gas at moderate pressures. I didn't look it up, but I assume maybe that you're running the gas would at the supercritical state. And if so, like mm -hmm. what's really the difference between running it as a gas and a liquid? It, it handles pretty similarly. Um, the second question is, do you feel that like the near-term 
materials that we're using in radiators in space are going to be adequate for the generation of nuclear power sources you're working on? Like, can you use aluminum, or do you have to start using more exotic materials out on your radiators, and, you know, are they of reasonable size? And the third question is, you didn't touch on the nuclear salt water rocket. So oh, yeah. Have any thoughts on that? <laughs> um, Okay, so I'll start with the first one, supercritical versus high <laughs> pressure. Um, with, with, I, with things like helium, um, you don't get a supercritical boost. With CO2, you do. With CO2, if you pressure, put pressure at it, if it's really high pressure, you can have a more efficient cycle. But with helium, it's only about density and how much coolant you can get off of it. So there's no intrinsic advantage to going to higher pressures unless you're wanting to remove more heat type of thing. So most of the ones, the helium ones, those are actually, we're talking a couple atmospheres to maybe 15 atmospheres. Or like they're well below what most people would consider kind of, um, I think super, technically super critical helium also has to be like incredibly cold, but for CO2, um, for CO2 there might be a big advantage. But again, if you have higher pressures, you need thicker walls too. So there's this thing going on Earth, generally more compact is fine if it's a bit heavier or whatever. And space, weight is everything that matters. So you have to look at, now that we've gotten these higher pressures, do we need thicker pipes and how does that? It's like, it's like a big system uh, model question. Um, so let's see, you talked about the, the salt water rocket is one where Instead of containing your, your, your nuclear materials, you throw them together inside almost like a combustion chamber, just like a normal rocket, and you let them uh, fission and create a lot of energy, and you just throw them out the back of your rocket. And I think, I, I think that one, it's kind of falls in, like, I'm in the very conservative side of things, of like, well, I, I have a technology where I can honestly say it's 100% not going to be a problem. And then when you talk about salt water rockets, I have to be like, well, now I have to figure out if, if it's like leaded gas, right? Is it like leaded gas? Leaded gas was, yeah, it proved efficiency, but eventually when everyone was using it, it started causing problems. So maybe like one salt water rocket would be fine. So I haven't, I think it, it's definitely something we're studying. Can you have a middle question? Oh, it's about uh, radiator materials. Oh yeah. The sizes that we're using in space, you know, like, for some of these concepts you're looking at, do you need, you know, acres and acres of mm -hmm. aluminum radiators, or do you have to go to even higher temperature materials? I've looked pretty heavily into this issue, and it's all about temperature. So, if you have a radiator at room temperature, and then it, it emits a certain amount of heat, just like a frying pan. A frying pan, if you heat it up a certain amount, it emits a certain amount of heat. Um, just to segue a little bit, on Earth, we have rivers, we have oceans, we have air. And when we have a thermodynamic cycle, there's a certain amount of heat that we have to get rid of. So we can use these oceans, rivers, and air to get rid of it. So usually um, there's cooling ponds and things like that. But in space, you only have radiation, unless maybe you're on an asteroid, you might be able to reject heat to the asteroid or something. But when you're in space, uh, your radiators are really big if they're low temperature. So if they're at room temperature, if they're a certain size, if you take it from room temperature to 300 Celsius, which is, you know, three times, yeah, 300 Celsius, you 1 16th the size of your radiators because it's T to the fourth power. Uh, Stefan's Boltzmann law, yeah, exactly. And so the way you make your radiator smaller is by going to higher temperatures. And there are plenty of radiator materials, but you can't, you get to a point where you can't use aluminum. Um, most of the ones they talked about are uh, graphite or carbon fiber type ones. There's some that actually uh, um, I like quite a bit that are almost like a woven textile of, of carbon fibers. And um, these types of things can definitely, they can go up higher than the reactor can handle in a lot of the cases. So. The radiator technology is it's still, I would say, TRL level four, something like that, but it's got a pretty clear development path forward for them. Um, I think the long poles in the tent in terms of developing electricity in space, the first one is the high temperature nuclear fuel, and that's what I believe my company does really well. So I, I think we can handle that one. 
The second one is the, the energy conversion. So your turbine is, is something that spins at really high temperatures. And for jet aircraft, um, they can do film cooling where they flow some air through it. And they also can maintenance them every 100 hours. Well, if you don't want to maintenance them and, you, and, you, and film cooling is pretty hard, you have to look at higher temperature turbines. And you can't use metal. You have to start looking at either really either like refractory metals or ceramics and those that, that's a an area of a lot of interest so i think that one if anyone knows anything about ceramics everyone has to talk to <laughs> yeah yeah so uh it'd be great to use nuclear power for all kinds of space probe applications uh, going beyond jupiter permanently shadowed craters getting resources out all that sounds great um but it's just not currently really accessible to a lot of um, people who are thinking about in-space resource, uh, resource gathering and utilization. Um, are there any policy steps that your company is working on to get these materials more accessible to the people that are trying to get those resources from, from space? Yeah, absolutely. There's, the first one is, I think, um, in terms of our company, the thought is, is you build a terrestrial reactor and it just so happens to work really well in space, too. And there is, right now, there's a four-year launch approval process for nuclear-type materials. And it's only really been vetted by government agencies type of thing. So this would kind of be new paths, pathways. Um, and there is a lot of reception in Congress, especially for looking at space laws. Like, they just passed the law that you could keep whatever you mine on an asteroid. Um, so. There might be some, some, I would argue, we need something that's commensurate with the risk. So if, you, if, if we can show this uranium reactor, even if the worst case scenario, it poses no threat, I think that um, that's a definite policy step that we need to move forward with. I think the timeline uh, for that is in the, in the near future. Um, but right now, we're mainly looking at the kind of the getting the terrestrial slash kind of earth design working, because that's going to take take a little while. Um, What's the current timeline for your company with that? It's a good question. Um, a lot of it depends on money, actually. I would say if, if um, like I said, Rick Over was, was the boss back in the day in the 1950s. He got the Sea Wolf going in, in five years. Um, such a thing would be possible with a lot of money, with, with a lot less money. I mean, it would be definitely be there's, there's these timelines. So Elon Musk kind of talks about, he said something about 2024, but I think he's kind of more on the 2028 time frame, 2030. So within those time frames, I think something can be arranged. You know, if we, if we um, especially, I guess, the earlier that we know exactly what we're designing, and who we're, we have some customer development to do it, to figure out what do people want exactly. Um, but there's, there was also the SNAP 10A, which was the only US reactor back in 1965. And that thing was only a couple of years from, oh, we can put a reactor in space to putting it in space. And what failed on it was the power supply. So after 43 days, the power supply failed and the thing turned off. And, uh, but that was a proof of concept and everybody knew it was a proof of concept. And back in the 60s and 70s, they're like, we really know how to do nuclear, but the only things, the only applications we have are weapons. Back, like back in the Star Wars days, um, electric propulsion didn't exist. There didn't, you know, asteroid mining. None of that. But that was all in the background. It was only basically attack and defense applications. But now, what's really cool is we're starting to think about it again because now we have civil applications. And um, another thing that we're doing specifically is we're really trying to target commercialization. So one of those is using what we call low enriched uranium. And I have to give credit to some of the people in this room that are my coworkers because they, they basically single-handedly showed that for the nuclear thermal rocket that low enriched uranium was a very feasible um, opportunity path. Whereas back in the 60s and the Nerva days, they just said, oh, we need the best thing. So we're going to use high enriched uranium because it's going to be a defense project. So um, we're very much looking kind of towards enabling a commercial aspect um, to all of this. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, 
<laughs> so earlier when you guys were talking about uh, radiators and all, um, is not that, is that not how RTGs work? Uh, Peltier effect? Is that what it is? No, uh, oh. the, the Peltier effect is where you have two metals right. and it has to do with their different temperatures. And when the electrons at the a boundary that kind of hit it, they actually create a voltage um, mm -hmm. between these two metals. Um, the radiators are just a way of like, just like your car has a radiator, <coughs> right? Like you got, if your car radiator, let's say, was drained and you had no water in it, your car would overheat. So it's kind of similar in, in a reactor because when you, most reactors you want to, comp or at least for the gas reactors, you want to compress, or for liquid reactors, you want to pump. Right. So it's easier to pump cooler things. If it's really hot, it's really hard to pump them. So you want to, to compress it at a low temperature and expand it through a turbine at a high temperature, high pressure. Um, so, yeah. You've all been a captive audience. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.